All right. So big question, of course, and I'm going to try to be quicker. We talked about the wills of God, or the, how to understand the hidden will of God. Understand the hidden will of God last week and was longer than I anticipated it. But I think it's a good video. Go check it out. I'm going to try to make this one quicker. So, which is difficult with a question like this. Why did God create Satan? Okay, why did God create Satan if he knew, and the implication is, if he knew what Satan was going to do, right? Which if we're Christians, we think that he at least knew what Satan was going to do. Why did he create him? Okay, here's, here's my primary answer and the biblical one. <laughs> I... Okay, so I don't know in the sense that the Bible doesn't tell us, right? So this is what's called a theodicy. It's, it's what we've called a theodicy, which means a, a question that's not really answered by the Bible, and so we come up with our own philosophical ideas based on the Bible, of course, but it's not said explicitly. So I, I don't know, but let me give you some ideas that I think of when the, thinking of this question. And this is one of those questions, by the way, that will sort of lead you down the pathway of seeing what somebody really believes foundationally about how big God is in their mind and those kind of things. So here it is. I think the conclusion is unavoidable that what happened is what God wanted to happen. That is, God wanted Satan to rebel. Now, there's a lot of philosophical issues with the, with the, with the word wanted and the wills of God and those things, which we're not going to get into today for lack of time. can do that if you want me to. Um, but that's the basics of it. That I don't think you can avoid the reality that God wanted to happen what happened. In some sense, that's what he wanted to happen. And if he didn't want it, it wouldn't have happened. That is, if he didn't want it in the sense of sovereignly willing it, right, planning it, being his plan, it wouldn't have happened. So here's the simple argument, I think, using simple language, not really trying to stay away from too biblical of language. Premise one, God created all things, which would include Satan. Premise two, God is all-knowing. And therefore, knew Satan would fall, and all powerful, and therefore could have prevented it. Okay, those these are all things Christians believe. We Christians believe God created all things. Premise one, premise two, God's all powerful and all knowing. Yes, Bible is clear. Premise number three, Satan rebelled. Again, clear. The conclusion, therefore, from those three premises necessarily would be that God knew Satan would fall, and He chose not to prevent it. Okay, God created Satan, knew he would fall and chose not to prevent it. Now, there's the old John Stuart Mill, David Hume argument that says, um, you cannot have both an all-powerful God and all-knowing God and evil exist. That God can either be all, um, or all good, not all-knowing, all good. God can either be all-powerful and just not all-good, and therefore he could stop evil but doesn't want to. Or he could be all good and just not all powerful, and therefore he'd want to stop evil but would not be able to. But you cannot have a God who is both all powerful and therefore capable of stopping evil and all good, and therefore would desire to stop evil, and evil exist. Which is, at, at face value, a pretty strong argument. There's a lot of issues with it, which we've talked about on the podcast before. Um, but this is, this is the kind of thinking that we want to use. The, the, the hole in that argument, by the way, is in the assumption that a good God would not desire evil to exist. And that's what we're getting at today. Um, the hole in the argument is the assumption that a good God would not, not allow or desire evil and suffering to exist when that's simply unprovable, and I think almost provable to the contrary, that a good God would want those things. So that's where we're kind of heading. Um, but if you're a Christian, you accept all these premises, and therefore you should accept the conclusion that God knew Satan would fall and chose not to prevent it, and so in the colloquial way of saying it, God wanted Satan to rebel. God wanted to happen what happened. The tougher question is, why did God want Satan to rebel? Why did God want Satan to rebel? There's a couple of options. There's a, there's a myriad of options, but they fit under basically two categories. The first one is that God basically couldn't create a world of free creatures. This is option A, we're going to call it. Couldn't create a world of free creatures who had the freedom to choose him or not choose him without allowing evil to exist, right? without allowing the choice of not good to exist. I do a podcast on, by the way, on... Um, the substance of evil, like, is evil a thing? There's a whole podcast on that. It's a long podcast. We won't do that here. The answer is no, it's not a thing, but we're going to talk about it here as if it is for brevity's sake. But option A says it is basically what's referred to as the free will response. That, that uh, To use Voltaire's satire, that God's doing the best he can. You know, God's, God's hands are kind of tied by free will, and if he was going to make free will a real possibility, then... Um, he had to make the possibility to choose evil. 
Okay, so that's a it's a it's a fine answer. I I don't that's not the answer I take or lean towards. Uh, I don't I don't think I don't think it's actually an answer, which we'll get at in a moment. But there are lots of men smarter than me that hold this view. Uh, Norm Geisler would be a good one to look up if you if you're interested in this. William Lane Craig holds holds a view called Molinism, which is very similar um, to this view. So check out those guys if you if you want to look at that stuff more. Uh, and there's plenty more. Um, and it's okay. So it's absolutely true that evil came into being, in a sense, as Satan and Adam and Eve exercised their God-given right to choose. Right. Um, but the issue is the inclination that would lead them to an evil choice. Where did that come from? Right? So the evil actually happens before the choice. The evil happens in the heart that causes the inclination that would cause one to choose the evil thing. And so Adam and Eve really had fallen before they actually even chose the act, right? In some sense, so they had, they, they at least had the potential to fall. And the, um, so the only way you can have an evil choice is to have an evil inclination that led to that choice. And the toughest question, I think, for the free will argument, and why I don't think it's really an answer, is, um, where did that disposition come from uh, that, would, that would lead them to that choice? You know what I mean? Where, where did the disposition come from that would lead them to an evil choice? A good God, holy God, created good and holy angels first, in the case of Satan. And then good man, everything is good. In fact, the only thing that he called very good. In, the, in this good creation by this good and perfect God, where did the inclination for evil come from? And I, you know, I don't have the answer for that. I don't think the Bible has the answer for that. But I also don't think the free will argument has an answer for that. I don't think saying, well, it's just free will is an answer. Because you have to answer about the inclination, about the disposition that led to, uh, led to such a choice. Uh, why were these creatures who were created in the image of God, the good God, the good image, choosing to disobey? How could they have that inclination in them? And, and again, I think with a, with a, a proper view of God's sovereignty, you have to come to the realization that God created them. He's the one that created everything in them, including those dispositions and those inclinations. Um, at, at the very least, knowing uh, what they would choose and that they would choose evilly, which is not a word, and then created them anyway. Folks in this line of thinking want to use illustrations like parents and children and say, well, if you parent your child and your child ends up doing wrong, is it your fault as a parent? Which I understand the point that's trying to be made, but it's, I don't think it's a proper illustration. I think it's apples and oranges because the parent is not creating the child, is not creating everything the child is. And, and above that, uh, or at least on top of that, the, ch- the parent doesn't know what the child is going to do in the future. And so I, I think it's an effort to get God off the hook a bit um, in a way that you really can't. And if God is big enough, really shouldn't. But, so, there's a lot of people that take the free will idea that are smarter than me, much smarter than me. Um, I I don't think it works because you're just not pushing the thought back far enough, I don't think. Um, But that's option A for you with the issues at hand. Option B, which is the one that I lean to, is that simply God wanted evil to exist for his own purposes, especially his glory and your joy. Um, So in that sense, evil is not good, right? By definition, evil is not good, but it is good that there is evil. Okay? Evil is not good, but it is good that there is evil. For if it was not good that there is evil, then evil would not be, of course, right? (laughs) Naturally. Uh, Augustine said, God ordained evil from the foundation of the world. We're uncomfortable with that. And I get that, and, and, and I'm okay with you want to take a more passive view and say God allowed evil. That's fine. Uh, but either way, he either, he either directly caused it or he passively allowed it. And in either sense, he's at least partially responsible. Just like if I watch a child die that I could stop from dying, drown that I could stop from drowning, I'm at least partially responsible because I could have stopped it and I didn't. So we have God being at least in some way responsible. Um and so the, the, the idea of option B that I lean towards is that God wanted evil to exist for his own purposes, that he had reasons for evil to exist, and what happened is what he wants to happen. And the idea that God's hands are tied by our free will, or that our free will could trump God's free will, by the way, is, um, I think, an unbiblical idea, and I think is, is making God much smaller than he actually is being presented in the Bible. Think about Romans 8.28, which is probably the most beautiful promise in the Bible. I mean, one of them, uh, God works all things together for good for those who love the Lord. If he doesn't have power over evil, if it's like some force out there that he just, if he doesn't have power over even over, you know, free will in some sense, 
and, and there's some force out there that that's like the trump card against him, then that he can't fulfill that promise that all things will work together for good. He can't do that. He can't fulfill that promise if he doesn't have power over everything, if he's not sovereign, if he doesn't have power over evil. If there's other things that can trump card against his will, there's nothing that happens outside of the will of God. Now, again, you can say decree, decreative will or passive will, but either way, nothing happens that God does not either cause or allow to happen. So God has his purposes for evil, and he wants evil to exist, and so he created Satan knowing what was going to happen because that's what he wanted to happen. Uh, we'll look at some more questions like this in the future, the same line of thinking. But think of Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, where it's Joseph's brother's situation. I have a podcast on this as well with sovereignty and moral responsibility, where God, uh, Joseph says to his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. That God meant that evil thing to happen for good. Or Acts chapter 4, where it says, Pilate and Herod conspired together against Jesus, against your servant Jesus, to crucify him to do it, uh, to, uh, by the instigation of the Jews. And then it says in the next verse, to do whatever your hand had predestined to take place. That, that the, the most evil thing that ever happened, that the crucifixion of the only innocent man that ever lived, was ordained by God. Was, was God planned, that great evil. And in that great evil, he accomplished his greatest good. And so he has his purposes and reasons for evil. Why did God create Satan? Why did he allow evil to, be, to, be, to come into existence? Because that's what he wanted to happen. Um, because it's better for evil to exist than for it not to exist. And again, we have these assumptions when we ask questions like this, or questions like, why did God create the tree that the knowledge of good and evil? There's an assumption underneath those questions that says it would be better if God would have done it differently. But how can we possibly know that? And, and, and how arrogant it is to think that we know really what the word better means, right? That we know what would be better in a situation, better for the universe than God does. God obviously thought it would be better if what occurred, occurred. Um, and of course, we see examples of this throughout Scripture, right? God uses Satan to test and sanctify Job, to um, test and sanctify Peter, to uh, he uses Satan to, to kill himself by... Uh, putting him in Judas, letting him go into Judas, right? And he ends up destroying his own goals, though he doesn't even know it, ensuring the greatest event in history would occur. Tim Keller says it like this, what if, what if God, just a hypothetical, what if God knew the only way you would reach the, the joy and glory in heaven, in eternity, that you could possibly reach is to put you through this exact world with this exact suffering, with this exact devil, and this exact pain, this exact suffering? What if that's the pathway to your greatest joy? Then the least loving thing God could do would be help you, or would be cause you to avoid that thing. There's a lot to say here about suffering and, and, and the redeeming qualities of suffering, and that suffering indeed is a good thing that God wills, uh, as opposed to what many people want you to believe. God does will for you to suffer very often in your life. Um, but we, we don't have time for all that. I want to close with this. Um, the devil is just not as powerful as we often make him out to be. Right? The Christian idea is not this dualistic idea that there's like two forces up in the heavens that are equally powerful and they're battling against each other. And whichever one uh, wins that day is if the day goes well or not for you. Right? That's not the Christian story. The Christian story is there is God over everything. Everything that is good and everything that is evil falls under the umbrella that is the transcendent God. There are nowhere near equal forces that everything that happens under that umbrella, good and evil, happens under God. That Satan is no more than a lackey on a leash accomplishing the purposes that God has for him. Hmm, come on, brother, preach it. Where's Jacob McCutcheon when you need him? God is the only ultimate responsible one. He is ultimately responsible for all things in the end. Lackey on a leash is Satan. He's not some something challenging God. He's, he, Satan has, and I'll say this again at the end, Satan has never once thwarted the will of God. Mm. <laughs> like if you think in, like in John 12, 31, right, where it calls Satan the ruler of this world. But the, Daniel 4, 17, for instance, the teaching of the Bible is that, Daniel 4, 17, the most high rules the kingdom of men and gives the kingdoms to whom he wishes, gives authority to whomever he wishes. You know why Satan has authority? Because God gave it to him. There's no authority except from above, including the authority of Satan. The only authority Satan has is the authority granted to him by God, because that's the authority that God wanted him to have for his own purposes. Psalm 33:10. the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. It doesn't say, unless that pesky devil steps in and really ruins things. 
<laughs> that voice. Proverbs 16, 33, one of my favorite verses. The dice is cast into the lap, it is tossed onto the table, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Every decision of the dice, every turn of the dice is a decision from God. Nothing happens outside of the will of God. No sparrow falls, I think Matthew says, unless the will of God allows it to fall. Ephesians 1, 11 and 12, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Again, unless that pesky devil. No. No. The devil has no power to thwart the will of God. Everything he does happens underneath the will of God, by the permission of God, on that leash that God has allowed him to be on. Psalm 135.6. Our God is in heaven and does whatever he pleases. In heaven on earth and the seas and in all the deeps does whatever he pleases. Unless the free will trump card is played. No. Again, do we have free will? Yes, in the sense that we are free to act upon our desires. But there's a whole lot of discussion to be had there. And again, your free will is not going to trump God's. Job 42.2 I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Isaiah 45, 6 and 7, There is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. You think it's the devil doing those negative things, but it's me doing those too. God is the big one here that the devil bows to. Mark 1, 27 says, Jesus commands the unclean spirits and they obey him. You understand that? You understand what that's saying? That Jesus commands the devil what to do, and the devil obeys. Because he knows who the master is. He knows who the one in charge is. He's not thwarting anything. Deuteronomy 32, 39, God says, I am he, and there is no God besides me. I kill, and I make alive. I wound and I heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. So, option A. And again, it's a legitimate option. I don't mean to be too pejorative of it. It's a legitimate option that very smart people take. I just, I don't think it pushes back far enough. I don't think it's a good enough answer. But it's a secondary issue. You can believe what you want. It is the, the free will option that God could just only do so much while allowing us to be free. But the second option that I lean to is that God created the devil because he wanted the devil to exist for his own purposes, namely his glory. He receives more glory in a world where there's a devil than in a world where there's not. Therefore, it is good that the devil exists. For his glory and for your joy. In fact, you will have more joy in a world with a devil than a world without one. Subject for another video. Okay, under 20 minutes. <laughs> Love you guys. I hope you have comments. Comment below. Tell me why I'm wrong. All those things. More than welcome. Talk to you soon.